Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration for a better world. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from the book entitled The Art of Being Alive by Ella Wheeler Wilcox, published in 1914. Life means action, from the cradle to the grave. There are limitless possibilities in this life to bring into realization whatever hopes or aspirations we desire, if we only but begin. There is no such thing as inaction during this life. We are continually going forward or backward. You are either stronger or weaker this year than you were last year. You are braver or more cowardly. You are more hopeful or more pessimistic. You are more capable mentally or less so. You have better or poorer command of your forces. You have more efficiency or not as much. You are near your goal or farther from it. You are a better human being or not as good. Next year at this time, you will be farther onward or farther backward. Every thought, every word, and every act of each day is chiseling out the statue you are making of yourself. If you desire to be an expression of the universe's finest handiwork, you must work with care. Delicate tools are these thoughts of ours and they must be used with caution. Every morning say to yourself, Today I will think of whatever is beautiful, strong, noble, wholesome, and worthy. I will entertain hope, courage, reverence, gratitude, and love as the guests of my heart. I will make thoughts of health at ease in the guest chamber of my mind, so disease may not enter. I will achieve something worthwhile in my chosen field of endeavor. I will work faithfully, but I will find time to sit alone with thoughts of the universe for a little while, and no worldly ambition or anxiety shall intrude upon that time. Just as surely as you carry out your days along these lines, just as surely shall the true meaning of life come to you, and you shall know the spiritual heart of creation and you shall know the meaning of life is found there, as well as all the things for which you long, health, happiness, prosperity, usefulness, beauty, and joy. You shall know that the earth is not a veil of tears, but a great and beautiful prep school where your soul is sent to study and learn its divinity and to develop its wonderful powers. Do not fret over those days when your happiness wanes. An occasional gray mood comes to the sunniest of natures, just as a gray day comes even in the tropics. And if we use this gray day wisely, we will all be the better for it. When the bright sun of summertime is veiled by clouds, one can see further, and the landscape is more clearly discerned because there is not the blinding dazzle of the sunlight. So, when our hearts are clouded with a passing mist of trouble or worry, we sometimes see life more clearly, and look forward and about and beyond with a larger vision. I think it is a good thing now and then to grow utterly sick of ourselves, and to sit down and pull our minds and hearts and motives and actions and ambitions into pieces and dust them out as a watchmaker cleans a watch, then to put them together again with care, and resolve to begin all over and do better, and then actually do it. It is never well to rest too long in regrets of the past, for that is over and gone and cannot be remedied. But it is well to remember the past enough to make it act as a guide and warning for the future, Moods of retrospection and regret and melancholy should be kept as luxuries and must never become a habit. Indulged in rarely, they may serve as a tonic, 
but regularly followed, they become a poison. When you are walking and carrying heavy burdens, you grow utterly weary and fatigued. It is not well to keep staggering on. It is better to sit down and rest a bit. Even if you feel as you pause that you can never go on again, after a little while you will feel more courage and you will go on. But do not sit too long. Are you weary with trying to do your best? And have you about decided that you will give up the battle? Do you feel that nothing matters very much? That whether you succeed or fail is of small account to the world? Do you begin to think you are a very small unit in the universe? And that the best thing for you to do is just to take life as it comes? And to make no effort to gain any special goal? Either intellectually, morally, or financially? Are you sick of the eternal effort to be and do? Are you contemplating a renunciation of all ambition? Well, stop and think a bit. What if George Washington had made such a decision in his early youth? Or Martin Luther King? Or Shakespeare? What if Thomas Edison or Steve Jobs had given up the struggle to accomplish anything? How much poorer would we all be for it? It is not merely you, yourself, who is to be benefited or harmed by your success or failure in life. You are to leave an influence on all who you know, no matter how humble your position may be. Throw a pebble into the sea and watch the disturbance of the waters. Larger and larger grow the circles, and as they fade away invisible to the eye, they are felt by the waves beyond our sight. It is so with each one of us. You are affecting every life you encounter on life's journey to some degree. You will affect lives of beings yet unborn. In what way and through what sources, it is impossible to tell. But nevertheless, an invisible influence is at work connecting you with other destinies as by an unseen cord. Think of this when you are discouraged and disheartened and push ahead. The fountain of happiness lies in the spirit of every one of us. How it flows through us depends on the aqueducts of the heart and mind and their condition. If they are clogged with the mud of gloomy thoughts, or the debris of petty aims or selfish desires, the divine fountain cannot flow and happiness cannot be experienced. Pleasurable emotions of a temporary nature can reach the mind from the outside, but this is not happiness. A new car, a new house, new devices, or a journey will produce a passing delight and gladness. But these feelings subside when the item loses its freshness, when the house and device become old stories, and when the journey is over. Indeed, with the average mind, which depends upon things happening for its enjoyment, the pleasure lies almost wholly in the anticipation. The moment the long for event arrives, disappointment arrives also. So many of us toil and hoard our earnings, living in impatience until the day we have accumulated enough to go forth and purchase what we believe will be happiness. After it is purchased, we then sigh and say, there is no such thing as happiness. But we are mistaken. To obtain happiness, we must clear the mind and heart of all obstructions and look into the clear fountain of the spirit. It does not matter what your religion or your belief may be, Christian, Pagan, Catholic, Protestant, Buddhist, Muslim or Jew. Just as long as you realize your oneness with the great cause and know that cause is love and that from love you come, and in love you live, and to love you must return. Once this consciousness takes possession of you, the foundation of happiness is set in action and will flood your being even in times of sorrow and in hours of pain. Pleasurable events, success, material gains, or gratified desires will add to your means of enjoyment. But if you are deprived of all these things, 
you will feel only passing disappointment. The waters of the fountain within will flow on and leave you with their gladness. Though you fall asleep in tears, you will waken in joy. Though you meet with a thousand disappointments and are encompassed with cares, yet you will feel hope rising in your heart and the rapture of life tingling in your veins. Solitude will be a delight to you, yet you will love to mingle with others, knowing all are one kin. Some people are born with a knowledge of their divinity and the universal spirit of love which binds the world. However, not all people are so born, unfortunately. And for those who are not, doubt, questioning, and despair often take the place of faith, reverence, and love. To all such people, I would say go out and look up at the stars some clear night. Realize how many millions and billions of worlds move back beyond those which are visible to you. Think of the wonderful precision and perfection in the arrangement of the solar system, and then consider how impossible it would all be unless some stupendous intelligence conceived and planned and executed it. Then sit down alone in your room quietly for a few moments. Close your eyes and breathe a few deep inhalations and ask the spirit of love and reverence to come into your being. Be silent. Breathe and wait. Free your mind of all other thoughts just as you would empty a vessel into which one was asked to pour clear water. Think of nothing but your desire for love and reverence. It will not come at one bidding if you have accustomed yourself to doubt and despondency. But if you take a little time each day and make your mind passive, only asking for what you desire, love and reverence, they will be given. Once your mind is filled with these sentiments, all other things shall be added. But the strange part of it will be that you cease to care greatly for all other things after you find the kingdom of heaven which is in your own mind and heart. You will be happy anywhere and under all conditions. Yet whatever is added to your life, you will enjoy with a new kind of enjoyment. Luck will seem to come to you in many ways. You will cease to worry and fret over trivial and material matters. You will grow strong and vital, and your tastes will be simple. You will not know what loneliness is, and your ambition will be to make the most of your own qualities, rather than to win the world's acclaim. Yet should that come to you, you will use it to the world's advantage. Your only fear will be the fear of not living utterly true to the light within you, which is the light from the source, the voice that speaks, there is only one need in the world, the need to love our neighbor as ourselves, to do exactly as we would be done by, to understand that the human race is one body, and that when we do anything which harms or hurts one individual, we harm all individuals, ourselves included, just as we harm the body when we injure any member, hand, foot, eye, or ear. When we stop and think about the world like this, we begin to view the whole process of life with greater compassion. Each being born upon the earth is striving for happiness from the cradle to the grave, in their own way, and doing the best they can. You may not know it, but the only satisfying things which you can get out of life are peace of mind, self-respect, and the love of those around you. Nothing you can obtain without these things, nothing you can achieve or become, is of any real value. No person can be happy without these three blessings, but anyone can be happy with them even though you are saddened by the sorrow you see around you, the sorrow which results from striving after the needless things of the earth, after the possessions of others. There would be no war, no industrial problems, no prisons, no economic slaves, no sexual abuse, if men and women all set forth early in life on that threefold question, for peace of mind, 
for self-respect, for the love of their fellow human beings. That is all any soul is seeking. That is all any soul desires. Because that is all there is in life worth living for. Yet there is war and strife, hatred and sin, sorrow and anguish, misery and poverty, because we have not yet learned that there is only one need in the world. The need of the world is love. Yet many people will say, how can we love our neighbor as ourself if our neighbor is all that is unlovable, aggressive, disagreeable, immoral, and offensive? This is a conundrum which has vexed many a mind, many a time. The answer is found by first taking a step back. If we pause to consider the subject dispassionately, we will realize that no sane human being wishes to be disagreeable and unlovable. It is a misfortune brought on by perverted conditions or wrong bringing up and accentuated by habit. Once we realize this truth, we will be sorry for the person we have been inclined to abhor, and pity we know is akin to love. To show generosity toward the miserly, gentleness toward the violent, charity toward the uncharitable, and unselfishness toward the selfish, is to actively take the next step on our spiritual journey. It is what the world needs from every one of us. Let's start today. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcasts, visit us online at livinghour.org. Today's podcast was sponsored in part by autosuggestion.io. Transform your life in 30 days. Discover the autosuggestion sound method at autosuggestion.io. And by Book of Zen makers of wearable inspiration and motivational gifts. Visit them online at bookofzen.com. Subscribe to the Inspirational Living Podcast by looking us up in the iTunes Store. If you're using an Android phone, download the Stitcher app and you'll find us on there. We deliver new podcasts twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. Thanks for joining us. I look forward to talking to you next time.